Welcome to another edition of Heroes of the Faith. I wonder if I said to you, what's your dream? What's your vision? What would you say? Well, today I'm in Belfast. I'm, an, I'm with a man who's had a vision and a dream and has seen it fulfilled 10 times, 100 times more, I believe, than he ever imagined or thought. Delighted to welcome to the programme Pastor James McConnell. Thank you for talking to us today, Pastor. And thank you for having me. It's been a thrill to be here. My wife and I watch your program and we love it. It's down to earth. It's simple, it's humbling, and it's reaching people. And we're delighted with it. Well, we're delighted to be here and talking with you. Behind every good man, they always say, is a good woman. And you've got a lovely lady there, Margaret. How did you meet her? I met her in a little church in Sydenham in Devon Parade and uh, we began to go together and uh, the next thing, I was pastoring our first church in the Orange Hall at that particular time and then I proposed marriage and uh, so we came together and that was it. So we've been together from 1959 until now. Well, I had a lovely story about how in the early days you had no carpet and somebody yes. uh, kindly gave you some and then it disappeared again. We had some remarkable experiences. Uh, this man came to my house and we, we had no carpet on the floor. All we had was oil cloth, what they called oil cloth. And uh, he said to me, I'm going to get carpet for your stairs. And I says, oh, thank you very much. So a few days later, a van arrived and a couple of men came and they put the carpet on the stairs and we thought we were living in Clover, you know. And the next thing, his wife objected. She was very angry. And uh, two days later, the same van came <laughs> and they took the carpet away. So that was us. But that was our story. But God prospered us and God blessed us and God gave us a great work. Marriage is God's idea, and yet marriage today, so many struggle with. And you as a pastor must have met and talked with many, many folks who've found it difficult times. How have you kept your marriage strong? At times it was difficult because I was in the midst of a move of God, and the church was growing. And I would say to you, I neglected my wife. I neglected my two girls. I would send them on holiday and stay at home because I didn't want to leave the work. And this is the way I did. And I did this for years. And it was very difficult. But now that I've retired, I have devoted my life to my wife. And I look after her and make sure she's all right. And I'm always in the house and I make sure she's okay when I leave. But in those days, I traveled the world. I traveled the world twice and I was preaching the gospel around and she was there with the girls. And I thank God for her and I thank God for the girls. And uh, somebody says, you could have lost your girls. I could have, but they're here and they love me and they're with me. Amen. You and I grew up in an era where it was very much the church had to come first. That's right. And, and, and our marriage had to be sacrificed and everything else. That's right. And it's getting that balance, isn't it? Well, you see, I was taught that, that the church came first. Whereas now it's different from your day and my day. Whereas preachers take their holidays, preachers take their breaks. They even talk about sabbaticals. I, I wonder what a sabbatical was. I just worked for God morning and night, night and morning. And I would have wrapped someone's door at three o'clock in the morning, burden for them, wrap them out of bed, make sure that they're all right and prayed with them. That was the way that I built the work here in Belfast. Amen. Well, we left the, the last program where you had the opportunity to tour the world. You'd got people like George Jeffries who were saying to you, come and join our ministry and, and go on the great platforms all over the world. And, and you said no. God is calling me to, to, to go with 10 people right. and start a little work in Belfast. I'll never forget that. Two of the ministers, their names was Gordon McGee and James Hersey. They were controversial figures, but they were godly men. And they came to me and they said, there's a group of people down in Whitewell. There's 10 of them and 
would you like to come and pastor them? I said, no, I will not. I was going to Sweden, I was going to Finland, I was going to Canada, I was going to the United States. The world was my oyster, and I was a young man, young preacher, full of myself, full of myself. And I said, no, get someone else. And they said, all right, we'll go and get someone else. But when they left the house, and this is what happened to me, a terrible darkness came over me. Something that Abraham had when a terrible dark and I knelt down at the sink. I was washing the dishes for this pastor and I knelt down at the sink and I says, Lord, I'm sorry. I'll go. Please forgive me. Because, you see, I was saved from I as a boy. I never knew what great sin was or immorality and all this stuff. And, but here was conviction. Conviction that I never felt in my life. So a few hours passed and they came back and I said, I have to go there. And they said, we've asked a man to go. I says, tell a man he hasn't to go. I'm going. And they said, I remember Pastor McGee said, how am I going to break the news to this man? I says, you'll have to break it to him. I says, oh, if you want me to go and break it to him. And he says, no, I'll tell him. And that's how I started the work on the Orange Hall. Ten people. And that emerged at the end, three and a half thousand came out of ten people. Well, it's an amazing story, and we haven't got time to, to cover it all today. But that very first Sunday, it was snowing, wasn't it? So it, everything was against you as you it, started. It was snowing, and one of our elders, who is still, he, he's 87 years of age, he helped me to sweep out the hall, and uh, we set out the chairs. Now, we had ten people to work with. That Sunday morning, 22 people showed up. I was thrilled at that. And on Sunday night, 64 people showed up and one lady got saved. And our offerings then was eight pounds, seven shillings and ten pence. I'll never forget that, you know. And that's how the work began to grow and grow. Pastor, there are so many people who are watching who may be a part of churches. They've never been part of a church that's been bigger than 40, 50 people. They lo would long to see church growth in a way that well, maybe not as much as you've seen, but they just long to see their church grow. What's been the secret that has been applied at Whitewell? The only secret that I know of is prayer. I walk the roads. You name any road in Belfast, I walked it, I prayed it. My breath has been on those roads. I've prayed, I've cried unto the Lord. During the Troubles, there was a gang called the Shankle Butchers, and they were taking Catholics, and sometimes they mistook, they took a Protestant, and they killed them, tortured them. And I began to walk from, I lived at the Serpentine Road, I walked up the top of the road, walked down Glen Gormley, right down to Carlisle Circus, right down York Street, right, I done that every night, every night. Margaret gave me my supper, and I says, I'm away walking. And then I noticed a police jeep following me these nights. And the policeman shouted out of the jeep, are you finished yet? They knew I was praying and they were concerned about me. I says, look, go you about your business, I'm all right. Said, no, we're worried about you. I says, you haven't to worry about me. Because I knew the angel of the Lord was with me and I was walking the roads. And you know, they disturbed me from praying. They took me home in the middle of my prayers, and they were doing that every night. Yeah. And it was remarkable, the, the experiences I had, but that was the secret. And then I met the elders. We had the little church at the bottom of the road, and then the angel of the Lord, as you know, came. And I said, let's seek the Lord. And we sought the Lord every day, or every night, for two and a half years, nonstop. And then God gave us the increase. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's prayer and hard work. Hard work, it? two and a half years, non-stop, yeah. non-stop. Mm -hmm. And uh, even on a Saturday afternoon, we never quit. We just kept seeking the Lord. And there's, there's some people, and they're through praying, but we were praying through. Amen. And that's the whole thing. Going back to the paramedic, uh, paramilitary, yes. I, I heard one story of an occasion where you were almost shot by a British soldier. Uh, when you were out sharing the gospel. 
we heard that there was a bomb to go off in one of the bars just down the road from here. And uh, I was concerned because our young people had a service. My daughter was there. And, uh, and then the police informed me that the IRA was busy. So I recently put on my coat and ran down the Whitewell Road. I just lived up the road from the church. And this young soldier saw me, he said, stop. And he lifted up his arm and like to shout to shoot me. And I says, I'm the pastor of the church. There's young people in there. He says, oh, I didn't know that. And I went in. They didn't know what had happened. Fifteen of them got baptized in the Holy Ghost that night. And they didn't know that what was going on. And my daughter was one of them. Amen. It was an incredible evening. Experiences like that. And... Uh, one night, two men came down to shoot me. Because there was a, a, not a bounty on your head, but an order was put out to assassinate you, wasn't it? That's right. There was uh, one of the loyalist groups, and uh, they sent two to shoot me, and the church was packed that night. And uh, the guys that, that came to shoot me said, there's two of them. He's got a twin. Because when I moved, the twin moved. When I spoke, the, the twin spoke. And they were confused and they went out. And of course, you know who that was. That was the Lord and he protected me. And this is the sort of protection. One other day I went out on my own and I can see the wisdom of the Lord saying, two by two. You know, he sent them forth two by two. But I went on my own this day and I robbed this door and I was pulled in. There was five men and they were making a bomb. I says, I'll never get out of here alive. And they said, we know you, McConnell. We know that you're a good man. We know that you're sincere. Now, we would not say to you, don't tell, because we would just get rid of you. And I said, well, you'll have to trust me. And they said, we'll release you, and they released me. It was a miracle of God. And they made their bomb. And I continued robbing doors. I mean, you talked about how you knew the protection of the Lord as you walked the streets. Yes. You knew how the Lord was with you, that you weren't assassinated. But bad things do happen to Christians, don't they? Of course they do, because I had men of my, my... My young pastor, he has taken my place. His father was an elder in the church. His father was shot by the IRA. He was in the police. His father was shot. Lovely brother. And uh, in fact, he was one of the ten that started with me, and he was, he was the one that gave the first ministry in tongues in the Orange Hall, and I interpreted that God would bless and breathe upon us. So remarkable experiences and remarkable stories that would take a lifetime to tell all that has happened. Well, if I said to you this morning, could you just share a couple of stories maybe of lives which have been transformed by the power of Christ, what would you say? Who would you pick? There's a lady, I've got to be careful how I mention this lady. She's in England at the minute. She was a prostitute. And I remember being out on Royal Avenue, what they call Royal Avenue, walking past a store. And this young woman shouted to me, Jim McConnell. And I says, yes. And she was pregnant. And she said to me, when I have my baby, Will you dedicate my baby? And the other pastor said, Don't bother with her. She's a prostitute. I says, You bring your baby. She brought the baby to the Orange Hall. I dedicated her baby and she got saved. Mm -hmm. That was all right. So she said, People are not coming to hear you. And I'll never forget this. She went and she booked a double decker bus and she packed it. They were hanging out of the very windows and they came up the Whitewell Road and what a blessing she was to the church. She had three boys after that and they're now working in the government. Right. They've done well. What a, a tremendous trophy of grace. Right. That's, one of the, that's one of the stories. Just story after story, paramilitaries, murderers. I remember one Sunday morning there was a row 
There's rows in the church, maybe 16, 18 in a row. And there was a lawyer, there was a paramilitary, there was a doctor, there was a nurse, there was a paramilitary, there was an IRA man, there was a UVF man, you name all in the one row, all worshiping God, their hands in the air. People saved constantly. Mm-hmm. You've talked about the importance of prayer and hard work. Here you are building a church, God is blessing you, Uh, people are coming to Christ and becoming part of a church, but that wasn't enough for you. You you felt this drive from the Lord to hold big crusades throughout Northern Ireland. That's right. I remember the first time we went, it was the King's Hall. The King's Hall was the largest auditorium in Northern Ireland, and uh, I says, I'm going to do what George Jeffries did. He packed it 10,000, and uh, he packed it in the 1930s. Wonderful. And uh, I remember going to the manager of the, I'll tell you how it started. I was visiting a person in Dunmurray, and was stopped outside the, the, the cars. I stopped the car at the lights at the King's Hall, and the inner voice spoke to me, said, could you fill it? And I said, no, but we could fill it, you and me, Lord. I'm talking to myself. Mm -hmm. And if people had seen me in the car, they thought it was not wise. But the voice said, could you fill it? I said, no, I couldn't fill it, but you and I could fill it. And he says, then let's fill it. And I began to spread the word around our people then. And uh, I went to the manager and I said, could I book the hall? He says, now, what part of the hall do you want? I says, I want it all. He says, I'll give you 6,000. I says, no, you will not give me 6,000. I says, I want every part of the hall. He says, it'll cost you a fortune. I says, I don't care. I told the Bitewell people, and that Sunday we lifted 100,000 pounds to pay for the rent of the hall and for everything that was there. And uh, so... I remember that night, the the trail of buses. Everybody had to bring 10 people. And if church people are watching me, here's here's the bringers. Mm -hmm. We all were bringers. I had to bring 10 people. In fact, I rented a bus and put the bus outside my house and people, my neighbors all came to it and filled the bus. And there was scores of buses going up. And I remember the ground floor had been filled and I knew the ground floor held 6,000. But the next thing, 10 minutes later, the galleries, everything was filled. That night, 10,000 showed up and we turned hundreds away. That was the first time. We filled it seven times. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just for King's Hall. You went on and did it at the uh, the Dossie Arena, is it? We 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 went to Windsor Park. Windsor Park, It rained the whole week and it rained all day and 12,000 showed up Mm -hmm. to Windsor Park. We then went to the Oval. And we, we tried it, an experiment in the afternoon. It wasn't brilliant in the afternoon, but we tried an experiment. 7,000 showed up at uh, the Oval. Then we went to Inver Park football ground, Clandy Boy Park, Seaview, you name it. We were there. And uh, five years ago, we went to uh, Ravenhill Rugby ground and 12,000 showed up there. So. God is still blessing and we still reach out for people. Pastor, as I listen to you, I feel exhausted and I'm sure many of our viewers are thinking, how? <laughs> but you, you must, there must be times when you get exhausted. Yes. But a remarkable, I'll tell you this experience. We were going to Windsor Park. Now, Windsor Park is the, uh, it's the national stadium of the Northern Ireland football team now. And I remember that week we had worked hard, giving out handbills, going down to the shipyards, everywhere, the Soraka works, the rope works, you name it. We were all there. And uh, I remember one morning, waking up with a sweat in my head. And this figure lifted me from the bed and threw me on the bed. And the figure said, I'm the prince of this land. You're not going to have it. And I said, I will have it in the name of Jesus. The devil attacked me in my own bedroom and lifted me in the bed and threw me on the bed. And I said, Lord, you're going to bless Windsor Park. 
And it rained the whole week, rained all that day. But as I said, 12,000 people showed up and hundreds were saved. Amen. Amen. What a story. Well, there are lots of things I'd like to talk to you about, but you have had an experience in court, maybe more than one occasion. And I don't want to dwell on all the, the, the situation of why you went to court, but there may be some young pastors who are listening to this program or some people who are involved in leadership within the church and, and they're, they're struggling with the whole way that our country is going in terms of what they can do on the streets and what they can say and not say. From your perception as an elder statesman looking on, what, um, what advice would you be giving to young pastors today and young leaders of churches? I'm saying to young pastors, as I said to my own young pastor now who has taken my place, I said, David, you've got to win your spurs. And I'm saying to men of God out there, get rid of the comfort zone. You've got to win your spurs. I felt led to preach on 1 Timothy chapter 5. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And I mentioned the Muslims. The next thing, the BBC attacked me and they put me through the mill. I was on television <clears throat> three times a day for six weeks. I was in every newspaper around the world. Everywhere attacked me that I was attacking the Muslims. And if there's a Muslim listening to me today, I want to tell you that I love you, that I care about you. I don't agree with your theology. I don't agree with your God, but I love you. And I love the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was my stand. The police then arrested me. They arrested me twice. They then said that I would go to prison. And I said, I will go to prison. And I said to the judge, if you find me, I will not pay the fine. He says, then you will go to prison. I says, that's all right. <clears throat> I says, if you slap me around the wrist and tell me not to speak any more about this, I will do it. As soon as you tell me that, I'll go outside the court and I will do it. So I think I twisted the powers that be. I rang, ran ring a ring a rosy around them because they were torturing me and I said, I'm going to stand for the Lord. And I'm saying to young pastors, the time was coming when you will have to stand for the Lord. <clears throat> I won a lot of respect. <clears throat> I lost friends through it. I gained other friends through it. That's what happens. But that's what happened to the early church. They were whipped. They were told not to speak at all in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were told about political correctness as we have it today. And, uh, but they went ahead and says, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And I want to make it known on television today, and even to the Muslims, that I love them, and I'm there to help you. I cannot speak the things that I have seen and heard, that I will take my stand until I die for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, so many folks certainly connected with Revelation TV were praying for you at that time. Yes, and, and I'm I sure they continue that. to pray for you. I wonder, as we come to the end of our program, whether you could just turn to your camera and would you pray for our viewers who are watching this moment of time that they just might know the Lord and the power of his resurrection. Gracious and eternal Father, I come to thee this day in the name of your lovely Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for sending him into the world to die for me, a guilty, hell-deserving sinner, and you've changed my life. Lord, there's thousands of people out there. Would you bless them? Would you help them? They're watching this program. Will you touch them by your presence? Touch them by your power? Will you come to them in the night watches while they're lying in their bed? Speak to them. Lift them out of that bed. Touch them and reveal yourself to them as a wonderful Savior and a wonderful Lord. Would you meet their needs? There's people there, their marriages are breaking down. There's people there with cancer. There's people suffering. Will you come to them? Will you touch them? Will you be all that they need? And let them know 
that there's a God in Israel, a God who can meet every need, a God who's lovely and he's wonderful. Receive our thanks, Lord. Thank you for this program. Thank you for Revelation Television. Bless them, use them, and make them a great blessing in the days that lie ahead. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Pastor James McConnell, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for giving of your time. May the Lord continue to bless you, and may he bless you too. Thank you for watching Heroes of the Faith. Bye-bye.